everything from here on out is official and on the record. So um, I hopefully it sounds awesome. I had our, my moment to get warmed up and uh, and get to know you folks. So yeah, we are talking today about uh, blower door testing for better thermal imaging, and and I want to get a, maybe give you a little bit more detail about what that really is going to mean. So what that means is this particular session, this particular webinar, is not necessarily so much about thermal imaging, about you know using an infrared camera. It's what it's not about. It is not about any specific processes or protocols that are enforced by any agency or official body. What it's not about, it's not about learning to use the the, the actual equipment, the actual IR camera you have. Um, in fact, it's not even going to be about all of the many, many applications uh, for a uh, thermal camera. What it's going to be specifically about is a little bit more about using uh, thermal cameras with blower doors. In fact, I, I guess I should, I should go back and just give you the title. It's more about blower door testing for better, better thermal imaging. So hopefully you enjoy it, hopefully you find it interesting, and uh, hopefully the pace is all right. And remember, if ever the pace is a little bit too slow or a little bit too fast, let me know. So every once in a while before I move on, I'm going to, be, uh, I'm going to read your questions and see if there's anything that I can ask right now or answer right now. Um, so that's me on the left there. That's your buddy, that's your pal, that's Mr. Jay West. Uh, I'm an educational consultant for RetroTech. I am a, uh, a private consultant, independent consultant. I am a trainer for them. It is my, uh, my, my of course, my, my major, uh, major source of, uh, of, uh, for my consultant company. Um, but if I say anything that you agree with uh, and everything that you agree with and that you like, um, you can always uh, make sure that you, that you sort of connect that with RetroTech. If there's anything I say that you don't like or is uh, absolutely not true, uh, that's on me. That was that was my personal opinion. <laughs> and I'll try and make sure that, that I that I capture that. Um, all kidding aside, this is Joe Menosh. He's not with us today. But also my partner in crime and another independent trainer. What we will talk about today, blower door testing, uh, some of the best testing methods, some best practices for those methods. We're going to talk about finding leakage with blower doors and IR cameras, uh, which again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, kind of what we're going to focus on as far as applications for IR cameras. Um, we're going to talk about some of the requirements for IR evaluations with the blower door, some of the things you need to make sure that you do for you to actually get a, a repeatable and dependable or reliable test. Um, baseline measurement options, some of the options that you have for just getting like baseline, uh, you know, sort of where to start with. Um, how to identify air leakage versus thermal differences, which can be, uh, can be actually a, a big thing. That will actually be sort of a theme throughout uh, our discussion here. And then Wi-Fi testing with blower door and IR cameras, and hopefully you're very interested in that. Um, I had a, had a chance to talk to a friend of mine this morning, uh, a guy who I, I trust and admire and who has a great deal of knowledge about the industry. And I asked him, what, was there one thing that you think I should, that I should mention that I should focus on uh, just in general? And he said, just make sure that you calm people's fears um, the, uh, in the whole entire industry about technology and about some of the... Um, especially about some of the Wi-Fi components and some of the Bluetooth components and some of these uh, some of these other tools that are coming on that seem like um, you know technology overload and the idea is that we are getting to the point in technology where it's actually um, helpful uh, where it's actually useful okay so any questions about that is there any aspect before we go on to the next slide are there any aspects of this discussion that you really want me to focus in on you want me to hone in on to target to make sure that I mention. Please use your question panel to let me know. I'm not seeing anything yet, so let's move on. So I want to make sure that there's a few things that we're clear clear about here <clears throat> before we go on. Yes, a great deal of our discussion is focused on the DM32, which is the most up-to-date, newest, and sort of the flagship of the whole uh, of all the RetroTech products. Um, this is sort of the uh, I love I love to t tell the joke the analogy of the DM32 as sort of the like the uh, the ring to rule all rings right from a famous book R.R. Tolkien or movie. <laughs> 
but that doesn't mean that uh, all these things don't apply to a DM32 or a DG700. So, so I will make sure that I, speci that I specify when certain subjects or certain activities or um, certain processes are only specific to the DM32. And yes, uh, I can see that I have some people that are maybe answering the question already, but the next question is, which one of these guys do you have? Um, let me know. Um, if you have a DM2 and a DM32, let me know that you have both. If you have DG700, DM2, DM32, let me know that you have all three. But let me know which ones you're using. This is going to be really important to help me uh, focus on, uh, on my delivery and, and make sure that, again, that I've customized my delivery to you. All right, getting lots of really good res res answers there responses. So as you're responding, for those of you who are using the DM32, um, we talk about this every week, but even just yesterday, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who was having problems with his DM32, with the screen. And I asked him, the first thing I asked him, and this is a good buddy of mine, this is a guy who, who knows that I, that, I'm a, you know, that, I, that I teach and that I proclaim the, the, the beauty and usefulness uh, of the DM32, and he says, I don't have trouble with the screen. First thing I asked him, are, is your firmware up to date? And of course, you know, breaks my heart to say it. He says, no, I don't know. What is that? So we owe, so I want to make sure that once again, I let everybody know about how to update your firmware and how important it is. So how do you know if your firmware is updated? Well, as soon as you turn it on at the splash screen, you'll see your serial number for your gauge, and then you'll see the version or the build. Or uh, at the bottom left after startup, you'll see, or in the settings on the third page, you'll see your firmware. So at the startup at the bottom, you'll see your firmware. All right, this is your calibration date. Of course, that is specific to the DM32. You will not see that on the DG700, the calibration date. It's right there. And then here it says the version and the build, okay? And your version and build should be 2.4 build 71B1. Of course, in this demonstration, it's not. Or you can actually go onto the third page, go through settings, just tap settings, and then tap once again th this button, who's, you know, it's an ellipsis, I guess, until you get to your third page, and then you'll see this, the word, you'll see firmware right here. And if again, again, if your firmware is not up to date, then you want to make sure that you've gone to retrotech.com. And you've downloaded the DM32 configurator. There are lots of things that you can do with the DM32 configurator. Um, we have done some webinars about some of the, some of the software and, and uh, that we have, and if, have included the DM32 configurator in there. So I won't spend too much time on it, but I will say this: once you have it installed, and again, it's free. You open it up, you plug in your DM32 gauge using the cable that's included. It's a USB a USB mini cable and you plug it in here and then plug it into your computer. Open up that DM32 configurator. If at first it doesn't pop up, um, it's one of two issues. One, maybe the, the actually didn't physically, your computer actually physically didn't notice that something was plugged into it. So I would unplug it, start it over and plug it back in. And then hopefully your computer will recognize or what they call mount. Um, if not, it might be that you have a driver issue with one of your with one of your inputs, um, and uh, that is something that I can't help you fix right now. But needless to say, um, those are the two issues that we run into, and they are always specific to the computer. However, once you do get that DM32 that configurator opened up. You'll see that you can actually, you have three choices, networking, settings, and firmware at the bottom. Normally what it'll do is on the top left, it'll pop up and say this is the gauge that's con that, that is, it's con connected to, and it'll say download, update, or is up to date. So that kind of fills it in. Uh, additionally, if you have some of the issues, um, if you haven't been up to date, if you're having any issues with the calibration of your touchscreen, if it doesn't seem sensitive enough or if it isn't accurate enough, if the images seem funny, this is also, uh, you would go into the settings, recalibrate that, and then update your firmware. Um, additionally, if you have a non-Wi-Fi gauge and you want to upgrade it, upgrade it to Wi-Fi, this is where you'd put your uh, Wi-Fi code. Any questions about that? Yes, a uh, question from, or a comment from Andrew, um, that uh, Andrew, that yes, Andrew, you are correct. He mentions that it is only Windows. It is only Windows. Um, and that's, uh, so uh, hopefully that's not a deal breaker for you. Um, but yes, it is a Windows uh, uh, piece of software. So let's get into it. Um, let's talk about 
uh, thermography. Let's talk about IR. So, funny thing happened on the way uh, to an astronomer's convention in uh, 1800. <laughs> a guy named Sir William Herschel, uh, he was an astronomer, and uh, he, you know, he was a pretty smart guy. He basically, I guess, uh, invented infrared, in, infrared, uh, uh, um, uh, radio, I'm sorry, infrared, I don't want to say infrared cameras, but he invented the study of infrared. And basically he knew that sunlight was multicolored, so he had that figured out. Um, and he knew that it was a source of heat, I guess all of us knew that. So, you know, he did what the, you know, what the, uh, what the, what the Arabs had been doing for probably thousands of years before that, uh, that he took a prism and he separated and measured the temperatures of different colors of light. And what he did was, uh, once he did that, he found that the warmest temperatures were beyond red, were beyond red light and not visible. And so he was the one that gave this invisible radiation. He called it infrared, or beyond red. So um, I don't know if you've ever wondered. I often used to wonder to myself, like, well, uh, there's a lot of different colors um, in a you know thermographic image. Why is why do we just think about red? Well, there he is, because we're talking about infrared, which is basically uh, some uh, vis which is light or heat that is beyond the visible spectrum, beyond the red spectrum. Um, all right. What do you think? Pretty exciting stuff. So what is thermography? Well, I'm using the term thermography. Again, I really ap I apologize if I am uh, bastardizing that terminology. Um, I, it might be infrared, it might be thermography, but, uh, but this, is the, this is basically uh, my interpretation of what I googled. <laughs> basically, thermography, it, it detects heat emitted by a building and transforms it, or them, or the heat, into visible signals that can be recorded photographically and used to quantify and locate air, air leakage. At least, again, that's the way that we use it, or that's the way that we're going to, the, the application that we're going to discuss here in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. Any thoughts about that? So what is a blower door, or what is blower door testing? Well, blower doors are used to quantify and locate air leakage by using a calibrated fan to pressurize or depressurize. That's for those of you who are uh, from the United States, that does not mean that this is uh, Danish. It actually means that uh, it's, it could be pressurized or depressurize a house. So again, the, the thing that we find here in both the definitions is this term quantify or qualify, or maybe quantity or quantitative and qualitative. So that is really, uh, as far as from a diagnostic perspective, okay, the reason why we actually purchase these tools, the reason why we implement these tools, and I say we meaning uh, myself and the, those folks of us who use these things uh, here in our conference or in our sort of, um, in our group, <coughs> We use them to diagnose things, and there's two really basic kinds of different types of diagnosis. There's qualitative, where we actually measure it, where we actually give it sort of, for instance, think of it as sort of a range, an A to B to C to D to F, as we would say in sort of an academic analogy, versus a qualitative. A qualitative is really usually sort of pass or fail. It's usually true or false. It's um, so again uh, to extend that uh, that analogy. So that's really kind of the big difference between these two is that even though the infrared camera sure does tell us a lot, it still needs to be interpreted, and therefore it is uh, qualitative. It tells us quality is it good. At the, at the bottom, can we say it's good or bad? Uh, whereas blower door can actually give us an actual infiltration rate. So it says, um, so I'm, I'm going to read it, take a second here for a question. When inside and outside temperatures are similar, should we warm up the house using the furnace prior to testing so that we can see the temperature differential? Um, it can help. Uh, so the, the question there is, uh, or the answer there is, uh, it depends, <laughs> which is unfortunately usually my answer. But yeah, so if the inside and outside temperature are similar and that, I don't, let me just go on to these next couple slides and I, I answer your question now because I think it is, it is relevant and actually uh, it's a nice little segue into this slide. So let's say that there, so that the temperature is, uh, is very similar outside. 
So here, um, and here we, we're talking about uh, pressure, delta P being the difference in pressure, is about plus 8. So the house is a little bit warmer inside than it is outside, and that's causing a pressure differential. Okay. So I don't really have the exact uh, difference between temperatures here because I don't, uh, don't want to go into Celsius or Fahrenheit, but let's say inside and outside, it's relatively similar as your question asked. What happens is now we just change the differential pressure just a little bit. So now we go from positive, positive 8 pascals to negative 8 pascals, which is about a 16 pascal difference, which is uh, almost nothing. It's basically you know, the, the, the pressure that you would need to move uh, 16 post-it notes. It's very, 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 very small. But look at the difference in these two pictures. So we go from this picture to this picture, same, uh, same um, characteristics, same feature of the inside of a building, but the difference in the infrared or the thermographic image is significant. Makes sense, anybody? Any questions? So yes, we can, we can actually, when the, when the temperature is similar, um, between the inside and the outside, just using a little bit of blower door can make a big difference. And that's why, um, and even when the difference is, uh, is quite a bit between the inside and the outside, it's really important to use that infrared cam or to use that blower door because it kind of gives us our images right here on steroids. And that's, of course, uh, for those, I hope I didn't uh, offend any Major League Baseball fans, uh, but the point is here that is it essentially um, immediately in, in, uh, and uh, and makes a big impact or really in, in accentuates the uh, the differences or the the, um, the pictures the images that we get from an infrared or thermographic camera um, here is a simple black and white from an older one this is taken from and as well I have several slides that I've taken from the weatherization assistance program the standardized curricula that was uh, built by NREL and SMS for uh, by the Department of Energy for uh, for the weatherization program, and I, I I use these because I have great amount of respect for them, and this is fantastic stuff. I highly recommend it. But uh, here we have another picture. So again, here is a picture of a kitchen soffit, and which is very very difficult to see uh, before the blower door, and then we run the blower door, and then we can see even though we don't have a real high resolution here, we can see there is a gigantic difference. So, any questions about that? All right, so I want to get in, again, breaking down, kind of moving from the general to the specific about this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're actually doing in the first place. Again, uh, why we're using these diagnostic, term, these diagnostic pieces of equipment. And in this particular application, we're looking to see how well our control layers are working. So, we're either talking about the thermal control layer. And that's where the insulation goes. And thermal control, that controls conductive heat loss. Conductive heat loss, and I will talk a little bit about what that is in a second, but I want to first go over that. And then there's the air layer, that control, that surrounds sort of the living space. And that tends to control, or is intended to control, the convective, uh, heat, convective heat loss, which is a heat loss that is from... Uh, movement of an air or a liquid uh, or fluid. Um, so that is, um, and, and don't get too confused. I, I know fluid dynamics makes it sound like it's a, like it's a very heady, very sophisticated thing, but really it's just air, air movement, air moving through and delivering uh, as as a uh, as a delivery as a medium, delivering heat, rather it be uh, to uh, basically to a place you don't want, either inside, indoors or outdoors. And then the thermal and air control layers should be aligned. Um, there's also uh, of, uh, heat control, or uh, there's also a radiation, but that's something that I that I want to talk a little bit more about. But no matter what, um, these the performance of these control barriers of the how of, of what we've done here for the house, the control <laughs> is that uh, it can be seen and can be quantified or quali quali qualified uh, by IR cameras. And in addition, uh, they can be very, it's very helpful to use, obviously, a blower door. So you need to be able to determine the cause and effect of any of these, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about diagnosing issues um, and making sure that we can, uh, that we can fix it. And uh, so uh, Dick says that it's magic. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're talking about heat loss or if you're talking about my webinar delivery, but either way, you're absolutely right, Mr. Ohm. Thank you so much.
So let's talk a little bit about conduction real quick. It is important, in fact, that it's absolutely, positively, uh, absolutely fundamental to our discussion to go. We can't go any further if we don't first understand heat loss and heat control. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're, we're trying to figure out. So here's a really, really nice, simple schematic from uh, from Charlie Goldman. Charlie Goldman. So I got these slides. These were from um, ACI 2007. I've been using these uh, in my training for almost 10 years now. And I really, really, really do love them. I really thank you, Mr. Goldman. Um, so you'll see some slides from there. But basically, this is it. So this is the outdoors. And it's 110 degrees outside, and it's 78 degrees inside. So what we see right here is heat movement. So the heat is moving from the warm to the cold, from the higher temperature to the lower temperature. And then what he's doing here is he's just comparing the difference between insulation and non-insulation. So without insulation, you get a lot more heat moving a lot more rapidly. And then with insulation, you're slowing it down. So you're slowing. So basically what we're saying here is fibrous insulation, um, the most common insulation, or basically all insulation insulation is intended to slow down conductive heat loss. Now some insulation, plastic insulations, foam, it's foam applied, uh, is, or uh, liquid applied uh, insulations are actually can also control convection as well, but not all insulation controls convection. Okay? So here, you know, we've, we're, we're basically talking about uh, either one, but we're thinking a little bit more about fiber stuff, and I'll explain why. So here is an actual picture of what that looks like. So as you can see, we've got, these are side walls. Um, this, I believe, is a picture on a wall, and these are uh, exterior doors. Um, and what we're seeing right here is at the top of this insulation, there it is warmer. So remember, uh, we can see now that it is at the spot, at this point right here on the wall, it's 79 degrees. But uh, throughout the house, we have a range of 83 degrees to 75 degrees. I'm sure this is Fahrenheit. Um, and what we're seeing right here is that obviously the hotter stuff, the hotter parts of the wall, are not insulated. Pretty interesting stuff, right? So when two surfaces at a different temperature are in direct contact, heat will flow from the warm material to the cooler until there's a balance reached. So the heat will flow through material based on its resistance to heat flow, and that's why we call it an R value, or R is, a, if, or I should say, uh, as a mnemonic device, it's a, it is a resistance. And I don't know how, how, how good your photos are or how good you can see on your screen, but you'll probably also know it'll notice that intermittently we have these little darker spots right there. Anybody want to take a guess at why we have these little bitty darker spots well, they're right there? I'll give you, a, that's right. There's screws, nails, fasteners are the exact term, and yeah, and then. But anybody want to give an idea of of uh, why there's a slight uh, slight te temperature difference um, behind those screws? Well, of course, those are studs, and it is conduction heat loss. Uh, Mr. Hall, can you please tell me, since you're so smart, Mr. Uh, Mr. J Mr. Hall, can you tell me what that what that's called? What is it called when heat is moving through a solid object um, and delivering heat uh, to another side? Let me know. Thermal bridging. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. He's exactly right. So here's another example of what we're talking about. Once again, another great image from the Weatherization Assistance Program for the standardized curricula. I highly recommend it. It's free online, waptac.com. You can download it. So here's another idea. This is what happens when insulation is settled in these end walls in the bays. Anybody work on uh, half-story uh, uh, half buildings with uh, side attics or, or the, uh, the, the dreaded... Uh, Yes, or the dreaded, uh, um, uh, what, what's the uh, building type, the, uh, the, the uh, found uh, in, the, in the northwest, anybody, want, or northeast so much? Yep. So yeah, this is an e-wall. So um, or actually, we're talking about either a slope ceiling or, or, or a gable side, Cape Cod, exactly. So let's take a look at what happens here. You can see in this image that we actually can find, if we go back, that we can actually see these darker portions of this wall where the insulation has settled or just is uh, not applied. Not as easy to see in this picture as some of the other ones, but uh, but that's there. But we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about give you actually, let me give you another example of some of this dreaded Cape Cod problems. Again, here's another one where we have um, same same sort of uh, same room, same same issue. Um, you can see that here is the slope ceiling, 
and here are sort of the, uh, the gable walls. And so these are exterior walls, and we have this darker pot spot right here where we're seeing um, uh, an, an end wall with a, with a window. This is, uh, like I said, the slope ceiling says to the left. The drywall here has actually been installed over original plaster and lath on the, on the ceiling. Um, and you can see that kind of on the flat where that's where that, that drywall has been installed. See how it's, it has sort of a different emissivity. But you can see the air coming down through behind it. So the darkest areas of those indicate an empty wall bay. So these are just completely empty. Um, the lighter shade, the, the lighter side indicates partially insulated bays. And you can see from just from these pictures alone that we have uh, obviously have some issues um, that uh, here you'll see that these are partially insulated. And then you can see some air moving through there. So I will talk about that in a second. So here's another another example, really very good example of really poorly insulated. This is cellulose blown into a slope ceiling. And so what we're seeing here is down here at the bottom, um, we're seeing uh, that this uh, that this is a post beam timber frame house, I guess, is that that is not that insulation has been blown in from the top, and then it hasn't reached down there. Probably hit a uh, a, a block or, or the wall blocking. Um, then so the the heavy dark lines are the main roof support timbers, and the narrow dark lines parallel to the timbers are the spaces between the ceiling laths. So a properly blown ceiling would have would appear solid, right, with no variation. But we can see right here that there is. And so what we actually basically what we can tell here is that this is where it's it's been sort of piled up, or it's not actually touching or not stopping uh, the conductive heat loss, right? And so here it's uh, it's fair to say that we are in a house that's warmer inside and colder outside. Very important to note. So that's conductive heat loss. Heat loss, uh, or conductive heat loss, or heat transfer, I guess I guess maybe it's, I should say, heat transfer from the, the perspective of conductive heat transfer is when heat is transferred between solid objects. One solid object delivering heat um, uh, to uh, uh, somewhere else, to a cooler area, okay? Whether it be indoors or outdoors. And then there's also radiative heat transfer. So radiative tree hand, heat transfer is a little bit different. So I'm, I'm not going to touch on that too much, but I want to do give you an, another example that came from, came from Charlie Goman. Um, and basically what we're talking about here is warm objects that radiate heat through space to colder objects. So with the conductive heat loss, we had solid objects moving heat. With convective heat loss, we'll talk about air or water or liquid, uh, basically fluids conducting heat or moving heat. But now we're talking about, when we talk about radiative, we're actually just talking about heat actually just moving through, uh, through it, it, it moving of its own volition and not through any specific medium, and that's called radiative heat. So basically, all of our energy is, comes from the sun, at least one way or another. And so all of it's kind of been radiated to Earth but um, it's easy to see, you know, a hot roof deck radiating heat to the attic insulation or a warm body radiating heat to a cold window. Those are the things that we see more often. But uh, things we need to know are that uh, radiative heat, when it strikes the surface, it can be emitted, absor absorbed, reflected, and transmitted. So those terms, you know, emission, absorption, reflection, transmission, those are all very, very important terminologies if you're going to be a savvy thermographer. Those are things that we won't get into. But I do want to point this out. One is that basically when we're talking about um, uh, about um, about thermography, about infrared, we're always talking about radiation because the what we're actually seeing is heat that's being radiated off, off an object. So even if we're seeing uh, even if we're finding problems with the conductive heat loss or even if we're finding problems with convective heat loss, what that camera or what that, that imager is telling us, and what it's seeing is heat that's being radiated or emitted from a solid object. And that's really, really important to understand if you're going to do this well. And here is a good example. Now I'm taking uh, the same, uh, this is actually a, uh, a mobile home that was before it was painted white. Here it's painted white with a reflective covering, and now you can see the big difference. This is where uh, you can see that this is where the it was had a stripe on it, and that no longer is there. 
But for our money, for our buck, we're going to talk about convection, convective heat loss. That's where the blower door really it meets uh, the, the thermal imagery, the imager, the IR camera. That's where it's really, really important. That's where it can really help. So here what you're seeing is what? Anybody want to take a guess what we're seeing here? This picture, this picture. You got it right, guys. We're going to have to replace that door. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, that's what happens uh, if insulation is in the path of airflow. Well, it, there's insulation there, but it's still moving through. So um, what we need probably there is just a little something under there. So this picture is actually shows a cooling air, or it shows a outside air cooling a ceiling. So here you can see that it's actually just very, very simple. This is without a blower door. We can just see sort of this, uh, this air moving up and sort of pooling. Mm -hmm. Right? And so you see that we're probably, if you looked outside the house, I would, I would venture to guess that, out, that that's where the gable vents are, just outside each one of these little cool areas. So it's, it's, it's air just pooling up and, and cooling around the outside there. So it's warm on the inside. But here's what happens when we turn on the blower door. So this is an obvious difference. And I want to let everybody know that uh, this, if you see, um, this is what we call feathering. Um, well, you can see these sort of finger lines of sort of the air moving across. And again, you cannot see cold or hot air. You cannot. What you can see is the way that, again, the way that a solid object emits heat. So here we can see now that we have a blower door running, we can actually see, and it's warm inside, so this is the, the, the majority of it is, is a brighter. And I should say that I'm sorry that I went a little bit too far without mentioning that some of these pictures are in color and some of them aren't. If they're in color, the more red tones, the oranges, the, the reds, the deeper ones are going to be warmth, are going to indicate warmth, and the lighter tones on the black and whites are going to ind indicate uh, 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 warmth, and then vice versa. So here we are, we're inside of a warm house, and we have some very, very cold air moving through, and we can see because the wall on the inside is actually cooling. So here it's much cooler because it's got it's the the uh, the convective heat loss or the air moving across it has picked it up and moved that heat away from it, leaving it extremely cold. And here it's just beginning. Another great example. So the difference between this picture, I don't some of you uh, some of you um, some of you more savvy or, or people who've done more blower doors will probably know what the difference between this one which is obviously has windows, which makes it an outside wall, and this one are. And this one is an interior hallway. So you see the, the two lights in here. But still we have some obvious, yes, and the blower door is running, um, and it has some obvious, obvious leakage. So the question, um, I'm going to stop. Uh, the question is, what is the, the blower door running at? And yes, it is. It is an open top plate. So either way, we're just looking at open top plates. This is an exterior top plate. This is an in interior top plate. But we can see it really doesn't make that big of a difference when we're talking about convection. In fact, it might even be worse. Here we can see a, another more profound line. And what is this? Anybody want to venture a guess why this looks this way? Some of you more, uh, some of you more, um, some of you that have more history. Sure, we got one guy that says it's a wood roof. For any anybody who's ever been on a, are there any are there any sailors out there? That's right, tongue and groove. Absolutely, I should have known that the uh, the Englishman would have known for sure. Of course, yes, tongue and groove, wood slat, whatever you want to call it. It uh, it is probably, um, and you can see that it's also on the sidewall as well, a tongue and groove, and that there's actually these cracks sort of moving through. And again, this would not be as nearly as obvious, or even probably obvious at all, had we not have run the blower door. Um, you can also see that right here we have some seriously exaggerated lines as opposed to, say, over here. And that's probably going to indicate to us that we have some really, really heavy leakage right here. Thank you. So the question was, um, what are we running or how, what's uh, the blower door? How fast is it running? What pressure is it at? So uh, the answer is, um, it depends. 
but it doesn't need to be at a specific pressure. And um, and I will talk about that a little bit more um, in a second. So thank you so much, Al. Yeah, it doesn't make any difference really. Um, um, it, whatever works for you. So uh, usually what people will do is, um, depending on how leaky a building is and how much noise the actual blower door makes, they might turn it down a little bit. Um, is more better? Not necessarily. So great question again. Is it better, folks out there, th those of you who've done lots of thermographic images with blower doors, is it better to have the blower door running higher or lower? So the question, well, I guess the answer, and I'm not getting too many answers back, but I guess, yes, again, it depends. Because what it depends on is, A, what the pressure difference or what the heat, what the, th what the difference is, I should say, uh, in temperature, what the delta T is between the inside and outside. How much do you really uh, need it? Um, how, how clear your camera is, all right? Um, so you want to make, so it might depend. And again, like I said, if it's a really, really leaky house, um, the fan might be making a lot of noise. And I might be trying to talk to, say, a trainee or to the homeowner. Um, and it might be making a difference. So uh, there's plenty of people out here that say that they like to do about an average of 30. Um, some say at about plus 25 to get up in the attic and see. Uh, yes, Andrew, thank you for us. Don't steal my thunder. That's that's one of my tricks. But yeah, uh, I see Andrew's got a trick that he uses that I like to use. So yeah, a lot of people are saying t anywhere between 20 and 30. Um, some other folks are saying, to answer your question, um, that it depends on temperature. And then as long as there's a pressure difference between the inside and the outside, it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, the more the merrier, some folks are saying, um, higher pressures may speed it up a little bit. Um, and uh, NJ, I'll tell you Andrew's trick in a second. But the point is that um, it all depends. Uh, what I will say is that it could be, is it is possible that if you're, say, for instance, depressurizing a house, which you're going to need to, um, to see from the inside to see leakage, because obviously if you're pressurizing, and you're inside the building, you're not you're not going to be able to see the leakage. Does everybody understand that? So in all of these pictures that I'm going to show you, I'm depressurizing this building so that I can see the you know I can see the the the, uh, the in this picture cold air coming in, or and in, in, if it was a warm house, if we were in the south southwest, the warm air coming in. But anyway, I want to see the infiltration from the inside. Hence, I'm depressurizing. But yes, it just depends. And it is possible that in this house, say if it's very cold out and it's very warm out, that I could actually run this test for so long that I could depressurize and actually make everything so cold that I couldn't actually see anything. So it does make a difference. Here's another really good picture. So, um, yeah. So yeah, and, and Andrew agrees with me. He says that his concern is that, with, uh, that you may normalize the house pressure with the outside uh, too quick at high speeds. But I will talk about uh, pressurization. Uh, when to use pressurization, Andrew, thank you. It's very good. And here's just another image. And here we actually are seeing uh, around, uh, around the, the, uh, the casement of, of an, out, of an out exterior door, we're actually seeing um, cool air pooling. Um, and we're seeing actually some differences in all kinds of differences in pressure here. And I'm sorry, temperature. So let's talk again. So we kind of, and, I, and I, this is something that I was meaning to mention to you, but I want to mention to you now. We've been working sort of backwards. So we kind of jumped right into uh, some specifics about different types of leakage when we looked at those examples, but we didn't even actually talk about what leakage is or bypass. So convection or bypass. So yeah, you can have convective loops inside the house that can move uh, heat around inside the house or inside the building, inside the enclosure. Not a super big deal for us if we're just testing the shell. The shell. However, if it is moving air from inside or uh, indoors to outdoors or from condi conditioned space to unconditioned space, then we have what's called a bypass. And bypass simply means that our heat is bypassing our air barrier, right? So that bypass, let's see, here's a, here's a perfect example. Here's a schematic showing an airtight can, how it should be sealed with gaskets, a decorative cover to, show, to, to cover up the, uh, the caulk, um, an airtight wire, airtight, all this stuff. But this is what happens when it's not tightened. And here again, we have, now we're actually in a cool home. And we have a, uh, a uh, exterior, I'm saying this is an attic, I'm going to tell you it's an attic that this light uh, penetrates through the wall and now we're actually, by depressurizing the home, we're sucking warm air into the house and we can see where it's at. 
All right. So that's a bypass. It's so important, and I've, unfortunately, uh, it's been uh, for many, many, many years. We've heard many trainers tell people to look. Hey, take a look. You want to find a bypass? Look underneath the sink, or look um, in some of the places they tell you to look um, that aren't really bypasses, because that's not where the cold air, or that's not where the heat is moving from the inside to the outside. Because if that sinks on an interior wall, which it should be, if it's not, that's a really bad design, period, especially in cold weather. In fact, if it hasn't, if the, if the, if the lines haven't broken yet, um, you know, the, then I would change that. But the point is that if you are, this, is, this, we have an interior finish on a ceiling that opens onto the other side into a interstitial space, an attic, a non-conditioned space. So if this was actually on a wall, an interior wall, a dividing wall between, say, a bedroom and a hallway, and there was a big hole in it between uh, the, the bedroom and the hallway, say, like, oh, a doorway, that is not a bypass. So I just want to make sure that's clear because, folks, it can get confusing to people. And here's how you know what a bypass is. In order to have a bypass, you have to have two things, pressure and a hole. So if you got a – here we have a hole but no pressure to push anything through it, so we have no movement. Here we have pressure, that blue means that actually it's pressurized inside, but no hole, so nothing moves out of it. But if you take both, if you have pressure and a hole, it actually will get, a, we get a bypass, we get air moving through. Here's a couple of great examples that we can go through very quickly, but if you have, say, just a five-gallon bucket with a one-inch hole, um, there is a pressure times the size of the hole here. You don't have that much pressure because it's not that high up, it's not that much water, and this little bitty hole um, pushes out. Um, so it's not that much pressure. This little bitty hole moves a very small amount of liquid. Here we have the same hole at the bottom of a very big tank, a big uh, municipal water supply, and we're getting a lot more flow, a lot more flow of water, and that's the same with heat. And then uh, compare that to two giant tanks that have the same amount of pressure inside, but one has a smaller hole and one has a bigger hole, and you can see that there's a lot more flow. So. I'm just reading. <laughs> I'm reading a comment by Stephen, uh, who says that uh, he says that uh, wearing a polo T-shirt. I don't. Uh, is that a name brand or is that something different? Uh, in any weather situation, as soon as you walk into a room with leakage, you can feel the cold air on your arms. Just saying. Yeah, that's true. If it's leaky enough, absolutely. But you don't know where it's coming from. So let's talk a little bit about how to run a blower door test. I want to go through this really quickly. So there is a difference. So if we are running a blower door test, a typical blower door test, and this was a question that we got earlier um, uh, that we talked about how fast to run it. So that's how it kind of differs from a blower door test, from a regular blower door test where we want to know the leakage, where we want to have results, versus a blower door te test where we're just using it in conjunction with a thermographic imager. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. So the first thing is, just like in a regular test, you want to do a building check. It is absolutely critically important that you do a full evaluation, not just for health and safety, not just so that you know how to set up the house. But if you're going to do, if you're going to do a thermographic check and you don't understand how the house, what's inside, what's outside, where the thermal boundary is, how the house is built, framed, then you will have a very and almost impossible time interpreting your thermographic images. I will say this, if you have a suspect condition, you might not be able to do uh, a full thermographic image because if you have a suspect condition, oftentimes certain institutions, certain organizations will ask you to actually pressurize. So where we're actually, uh, we're, uh, this is from the, I should tell you that these pictures are taken from inside the home, indoors. So here we're actually pressurizing because we found some suspect conditions, what, however you define those. So we're actually pressurizing. And here we're depressurizing because we do not find suspect conditions. But let's talk about those physical conditions, the regular ones. What's in, what's out, um, is that our doors open or close. You want to make sure that you know the volume of the house uh, before you get started. So these things are all very, very important. Um, 
you want to make sure that you know if you have, say, for instance, a garage overhead or an attic access in the ceiling of an unconditioned garage, if you have an air handler in the garage. Why? Because, and also windows, exactly. Why? Because the thing, another thing that a lot of people don't really realize but that, uh, that the thermographic imaging or that the IR camera, infrared camera, has in common with a blower door or with, I should say, a differential pressure gauge, the gauge that we use, in this case we're talking about a TM32, is that we're still talking about the difference between two things. So if we're getting a thermographic image, we have to always know what's in and what's out. We have to know which side is warm and which side is cold, because it, our interpreting those images is always going to be dependent upon, uh, upon understanding uh, what's in and what's out. So uh, Mo, come on Mo, Mo's question uh, is about what's the difference between pressurizing and depressurizing in, in, in terms of CFM50, completely different, uh, completely different topic Mo, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about that off, off, uh, offline. So here's some of the things, so what I'm showing you right now are actually images that are taken from, I believe these were made by um, by South Face uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, these are part of their air sealing guide. But these are really, really important for people to understand before they actually start looking at thermographic images. They need to know where those studs are. They need to know where the bats are. They need to know where these potential uh, bypasses are so that they can understand and interpret the images that they're getting. Um, another page, this is page 18. This has got some really great information in it. Um, and again, here is, uh, here's another one about some of those knee walls. Remember what we were talking about? So now I can see, well, I know what it's supposed to be like. I did a walkthrough. I know what I'm, what I'm looking at. I actually poked my head back here before I ran the test. I know what I'm seeing when I run those thermographic images. So here's what it's supposed to look like. And this is extremely important, I think, for especially for those of you who are not working uh, in retrofit but are working in new construction to understand um, these things as well. So here it is. Uh, this is what this is the actual um, guide. Uh, you can find it at South Face. I know that that is a pretty big um, that's a pretty big uh, uh, URL right there. But just go ahead and look in South Face here in the Learning Center. You'll see. Uh, Georgia Energy Code Resources, if you want to actually even do a, uh, a Google for that, you'll find this whole book that's really great. It's about air sealing, especially air sealing knee walls, but um, what it really breaks down to are things that you need to know about before you actually start running a blower door. So, run the blower door test. Well, um, so basically what we've talked about is getting the house set up, to looking around the house, understanding what's going on. Um, <laughs> and Joe says, what? You mean build it right from the start? That's crazy talk. It is crazy talk, Joe, because it's gonna, we, we, so we, we can't fix it. Lots of money in fixing stuff. But uh, it, setting up the blower system, same as normal. Uh, we are using a frame, you know, and as, as some of you may or may not know, uh, the actual RetroTech blower door is quite a bit different. The, the, the frame, the panel are actually quite different from the Energy Conservatory frame. Uh, you'll notice that our calipers and that our connections are, are quite different. They're, uh, they're engineered to be, uh, to be extremely strong, as strong as possible, and to go together very quickly, very easily. So anyway, setting up the blower door is basically the same as setting up a blower door for a blower door test. Um, so I suggest that you set it up the same way and just kind of keep it in there. Don't take it down or reset it up. That's crazy talk show. And then when you're ready to actually run the, the, uh, the, the test, your infrared camera, or if you want to run your infrared or your thermographic stuff, this is where we get a little bit different. So you'll see that we have, a, we have a choice here on our DM32 between set pressure and set speed. So if you're running, say, your average or your most common ASTM 779 test, you're running, you're going to set that pressure to that house to 50 to get, to get a quantitative result. You just easily just set pressure. You hit set pressure, you put 50 pascals, and you let it run. So end of story. And people often ask me, well, why would I use set speed? Well, this is when you actually would probably want to use that speed because what happens here is if I set pressure to say, oh, I don't know, 30, 25, some of the pressures that we talked about, but if I set it 
to 30 or 25 or whatever. If anybody comes into the house, if I open up um, an area into an uh, into uh, outside of the thermal boundary, outside of the pressure pressure boundary, my fan is going to ramp up to try and meet to try and stay at that pressure, and I don't need that. So what I might want to do is just set it to speed. Maybe I set it to 25% to 10%. So what I do is um, I set speed. I just push the button. Oh, I'm sorry, and I missed this. So this is what I was going to uh, going to mention earlier, um, and I forgot who asked that question. It was a great question. I think it was Anthony. Um, but yes, on all of the fans, all whether it be a, a blower door or a duct tester, um, all of the fans that Retrotech makes, there's actually a small knob on the side. So in order to get that thing to work, you have to do two things. Okay, folks, please stick with me. This is a good one. This is a really, really good one. One, you have to unplug your control cable. So if your, if your DM32 is plugged in to your controls via your speed control cable, it has to be unplugged because otherwise that basically shuts off this knob so if you don't bump into it or make any mistakes, right? The next thing you need to do is you need to notice, you notice the status light. The status light is a solid green. That means everything's okay, but it might be blinking. If it's blinking, that means you need to turn your fan all the way down, wait three seconds, and then you can ramp back up. So again, these are sort of... Um, um, sort of uh, security defaults for that uh, so that you don't run into any of those issues. But this is, might be um, might be even what you want to do even if you have, say if you're doing a lot of testing and you haven't had a chance to charge your, your, your gauge, you might even want to turn your gauge off. You don't really need your gauge to run an infrared camera. So you just want to make sure that you have a pressure difference and you can just use the knob on the side. That makes sense? So, oh well, yeah, question is, how do you know the pressure if you're setting it for speed? Well, the answer is it doesn't matter, at least in this particular case. So in this particular case, all I wanted was just to be able to see better with my infrared camera. So I'm not really concerned about what the pressure is. So yeah, that's that's why, uh, and that's a really good question. That's why so many people look at me confused and say, well, why would I want to use set speed? Well, you use set speed when you don't really care too much about the pressure. When it doesn't make any difference, we're not looking for specific results due to a pressure, but we are looking to depressurize a building to get certain effects, to do certain applications. And in this application, it is uh, infrared camera. And I want to pitch you something real quick for those of you now that I did add this uh, because I got a lot of responses for folks that are using DG700s. So uh, you actually can run any, if any of your fans, any of your uh, energy conservatory devices using a DM32. So uh, basically, the, we have what's called a, uh, this is a uh, control adapter, speed control adapter, and this will run, uh, this will actually make it so that you can run any energy conservatory equipment. So you don't have to make a big, uh, a, a big investment, you don't have to buy a bunch of equipment. Um, and we, uh, up until the end of this year, we will be taking trade-ins. Uh, DM2 or DG700, either one of these, we will actually take a trade-in um, to the and, and uh, apply that trade-in value towards your DM32 smart gauge. And before you ask me how much, I don't know. You'll have to go to retrotech.com. You'll have to talk to salespeople for that. So how do you find these bypasses when you're using that, that, that blower door? Well, um, again, here are some really good ideas of uh, some images, some ideas of, uh, of what it looks like um, when you're running the, f the fan. And here is uh, Andrew. I wanted to get to this. I'm sorry we lost Joe, but Andrew, this is what Andrew was saying, and I totally agree with you, Andrew. This is when you can pressurize with an infrared camera or with a, with a blower door and do an infrared. This is great. So here I'm in a cold house, and um, this is a picture I took. Um, I pressurized the, 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 I'm sorry, not the cold house. It was cold outdoors and warm indoors. Then I pressurized the building, stuck my head through the hatch. The scuttle hatch was actually sort of right in the middle of the building, and it was easy to see all the way around the building. And so all I had to do, I pressurized the building. I actually heated it up. Somebody asked if, I, if we might use the furnace to get a better uh, thermal uh, difference. I did this. I pumped, up the, I pumped up the furnace. In fact, I needed to, to test the furnace as well. So I ran that furnace up to steady state, got it really nice and hot, and while it was running, while it was reaching steady state, I then climbed in to the cold attic, this is winter time in Chicago, I poked my head up and I could easily just look around with my thermographic imaging device with my camera and take a bunch of pictures, and you can see right here, there's a very bright spot, and that's obviously a uh, bypass. So, oh, 
great point. And then it says here, uh, Greg says, bag your camera in a clear poly to keep the dust out. And hope you have a wide angle lens. Yes. Uh, the the you know the and then the, the sort of the 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 unfortunate problem is that if you have do you have a picture in picture, it's usually too dark. Um, infrared, infrared cameras will take pictures in the light or in the dark. It doesn't make any difference because um, it, it's sensing light that uh, naked eye can't see. However, if you do need a uh, a picture that is a regular photograph to go with this, you're not going to get it. <laughs> so uh, you've got to make sure that you know where you took this picture because uh, ostensibly this one was going to be used for building, uh, for actually putting together a a work scope. So we've got we're about four minutes over. Uh, I want to show you some other real quick images as we go through. Here is uh, here we have I'm um, inside of a warm house and this is an exhaust fan. Um, and I take a picture of it. It looks pretty normal, but I can see here that the inside uh, sh that 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 ceiling is quite warm, and the inside of this is quite cold. And it's not that big of a temperature difference outside. So that tells me that what right no damper. I'm depressurizing, so it might not so uh, it might not be a damper issue. It might actually be that there is actually uh, that this that this particular um, fan is not. Um, Maybe not uh, uh, not insulated correctly. Maybe the, maybe the duct to the outside is not correctly insulated, but no damper is the first thing I thought. Thank you, Steve. Uh, here we have a floor register. Well, this is a different story, isn't it? Now we're not actually looking uh, so much at, well, this is a over a uh, unconditioned uh, cellar or an unconditioned crawl space. And now we actually can see what? What does this tell us? Same pictures. Right, this the boot or the connection from the ductwork is not connected securely to the floor, and it's actually pumping warm air into the floor. Right, lucky beat, lucky leaky boot. Steve, you get the you win. Um, here's another one, another great one. And here's where actually this is actually a UFAD test. This is actually on a underfloor air distribution system our duct system that is compliments of our friend Phil and this is in a commercial building and what we've done here is actually used a blower door on this on this duct system to uh, uh, to pressurize that duct system it hasn't been I, I in fact I'm, I, I'm guessing that it hasn't been commissioned yet I think they were still working on it but then we're using our infrared camera to see what to see how leaky it is so very interesting um, and then to close up, I want to get to a couple of, uh, uh, I want to make sure that, uh, that I get to what we talked about earlier, which is a way to sort of use technology to use the Wi-Fi um, to actually run the smarter. So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you're in a, you're in a unconditioned space, you're running the blower door, you have your IR camera. Um, it makes it a lot easier when you're really looking for bypass, especially if you're on it, if you have a company that does the air sealing or if you're work building on a really, building a nice work scope, whether it be a duct system or a bypass, um, using uh, a free app, it's called Gauge Remote, you can connect your, any of your mobile, any mobile device um, to, I'm sorry, m minus a Windows phone but you can connect any mobile device minus a Windows phone to your blower door or your duct tester to generate uh, a pressure difference or to move that to, uh, to actually accentuate um, that, uh, that pressure difference so that you can actually see that on your infrared camera. So that can be inside, outside. It's really nice. Can IR help when doing a duct tester uh, at duct? Yeah, absolutely. Sure can. Can. It's always, uh, even when we're looking for just leakage in general. So here you can see that. Here's a guy that's actually um, turning it on and turning it off. Um, he's working in the attic in a suit, so clearly he's a very successful duct tester. So that tells me that uh, that using a gauge remote it will uh, make you uh, very successful or just not not smart enough to, uh, to not know not to wear a suit. Um, Here's another thing. So some of these new cameras um, that some of these infrared cameras that are out, some of these uh, thermographic imagers, uh, they actually have uh, Bluetooth and actually some of Wi-Fi even. So this is great. Um, yeah. So Steven says he's not more successful. He just charges more. Um, so uh, yes, in, the, in, in America, we think that's, uh, that's almost the same, I guess. But um, all joking aside, here we have a, 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 a camera that actually will transmit to this tablet. So imagine, not only is this wonderful, but I've used this myself where I can actually show a client, you know, what I'm looking at, 
uh, so that they can see and from their perspective on a much you know larger scale what what's going on there but I can also snap a photo or just do a screen capture of what I'm looking at so now I don't have to later on after taking my pictures take my camera hook it up to uh, an additional device and then upload those pictures I can actually capture those pictures in a device where or, and put them directly into my report as I'm going and that's huge so let's talk a little bit about about what that report might look like so I can be uh, in one hand, I can, or even with the same device, I can be running uh, my fan, turning it on and off, making sure I manage it, maybe even capturing uh, a seat screen cap from my device of what my results are, what my test results are. Meanwhile, actually walking around with my thermographic imager and then capturing pictures of that specifics to, uh, to whatever test I'm doing. So I'll take even one further. So many of you know that our cloud has been that our, our cloud our, our cloud testing app has been released it is no longer uh, technically in the beta phase it is actually out it's on the uh, Windows Store it's available right now only on Windows devices but will be out soon for Android devices and and uh, Apple iOS devices so this is a, a cloud storage and sharing and testing uh, device for uh, but it also captures pictures so imagine in your report, not only could you capture pictures um, the, from, oh, say, you know, the outside of the house or, all, or any other sort of different features that you want to add into your report, but you could actually add some of those thermographic images that you've taken with your Bluetooth or Wi-Fi camera. You've captured them and stored them in your device, and now you can just add those to your report. So think about the amount of time that's saved by A, being able to generate that report easily and quickly in the house, and then B, a, the ability to actually generate or to share that report. Or if you're not the tester, or if you're maybe a quality control person, or if you're an, or if you're an owner, um, how you can actually, or even a, a should I say, a, should I go so far as to say a, 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 a building code inspector or a building code uh, official how you can actually get that information immediately synced, uploaded immediately. So you can add that into your report. So that's pretty hot stuff. Um, if you're not using our cloud right now, if you're already out there testing, um, you can use any of these other sort of syncing online um, devices too as well. So you, um, you can just be taking your tests, putting them into your computer, and have those set up to sync to Google Drive, Dropbox, your SyncBox, any of that type of stuff. Very easy to do. Just go through the settings and figure it out. So that's it for today. I want to thank everybody so much for coming out. Thank you guys so much. Hope to see you again soon, and uh, au revoir.